Hardy Sabeti is a rock musician, but that's not all she is. When I was growing up, I was uh, very much interested in mathematics. I thought I would want to be a mathematician, and then when I got to high school, I took a biology course and an anatomy course and thought I wanted to be a doctor. Her doctoring ambition took her to Nigeria, where she worked with physicians and scientists to combat one of the world's deadliest diseases, Lassa fever. It is deadly. It's in that class of viruses like Ebola and smallpox, um, bubonic plague, the things that really frighten us. Um, but it's widespread. A lot of those diseases are either naturally eradicated or only are seen in small incidents. But Lassa seems to affect hundreds of thousands of people and potentially kill tens of thousands. Um, so you're talking about the only uh, deadly agent that is really widespread like that. There's a drug that can cure Lassa fever, but only if it's given early. And because the disease is hard to diagnose, people haven't sought treatment. The one problem is those early symptoms um, are fever, stomach ache, something that could be um, you know, uh, confused with so many other uh, diseases, and that's why most people are not diagnosed in time. Pardis and her colleagues are working to quickly identify the Lassa virus by its genes and so develop new diagnostic tools. Now that we can tell them, you know, come in, we can diagnose you early, we can treat early, we're getting more and more uh, individuals coming to the hospital. So that's just the first step. The next step has Pardis Abedi using her math skills to answer a medical mystery. Why so many people in Nigeria are able to survive the virus, even as it kills others. Even in the hospital, we sometimes see that uh, we will, when a, when a patient comes in, we'll, we'll, we'll test all of their um, uh, you know, friends and relatives that are around them, all the co people they're in contact with, and sometimes people will have the same Lhasa in their blood but be completely fine. Um, and so there has been evidence of genetic resistance, potentially, of resistance, and, and uh, presumably genetic resistance, individuals who don't get it at all. And that's what we're really fascinated by, are, are what seems like a lot of people who have gotten Lhasa who have not gotten sick at all. She's looking for a protective mutation. What I do is I go through the genome and I, uh, I look at every single mutation in the genome and I see how common it is and then try to see if something is young, suggesting that it's spread very quickly. It's potentially a case of evolution in action. While the Lassa virus infects cells by slipping inside them, the mutation Pardis has found may somehow fend the virus off. Discovering how the mutation works could lead to new ways to prevent the disease. That's the really exciting part, is that the, the work that we do has a lot of implications to human health, uh, both on a local scale for those individuals and on a global scale. Uh, and so that's what makes my life really exciting and rich. It's the sort of discovery that keeps Pardis Abedi in her lab, despite the pull of her music. It's that opportunity to make a discovery to impact human health. Uh, that's what drives me, and that's, that's the thing that inspires me. And it's, it's the discovery um, and the creative enterprise that I love. What I love about music is it has a lot of those same features. But to me, I think my place is in science. Jay Kiesling wants to turn plants into fuel for cars, trucks, and planes. Using the tools of biotechnology, he's taken genes from different sources and made them work together in microbes he can grow in the lab. These organisms grow really well on things like sugar. They'll grow very rapidly and double from a single organism all the way up to a culture of a billion organisms overnight. Once the organism grows up, we can turn on a switch inside the organism that we've built to produce a particular product. The first product of his microbe factories was a drug that cures malaria called artemisinin. Artemisinin is a natural product. It's produced by a plant. It was found many centuries ago to be useful for treating malaria. It's actually an ancient Chinese therapy. It's currently produced by harvesting these plants, growing up the plants, harvesting the plants, and extracting the drug. But that's an expensive, time-consuming process. We reasoned that we could take the genes from this plant and from other organisms, assemble them together in yeast and or E. coli and get those organisms to grow on sugar and produce the drug in plentiful supplies. Therefore, we'd reduce the price and increase the supply for people in the developing world. But Jay Kiesling didn't stop there. Artemisinin is a hydrocarbon. It's the same or very similar composition to diesel fuel. 
And since we had created a platform host that would produce large quantities of this anti-malarial drug, it was a matter of swapping out a couple of genes that produce the anti-malarial drug and swapping in a couple of genes that would produce the diesel fuel. The beauty of working with a microbe is that you can grow them in a test tube in the laboratory, or you can grow them in enormous tanks. It's a little bit of work between a test tube and a tank, but they scale beautifully. Kiesling's diesel-making bugs need sugar as food, and he now plans to get that sugar from an unlikely source. If you think about your shirt, a cotton shirt, that's all sugar, and yet it doesn't dissolve in the washing machine. Shirts don't dissolve for the same reason the stems and leaves of plants don't dissolve. The sugars they contain are linked together in long chains in the plant cell walls. So in Jay Kiesling's lab, scientists are devising ways to liberate the cell wall sugars from plants that are otherwise of little value, plants like switchgrass. Switchgrass is a native of the Plain States in the U.S. Um, it grows without a lot of fertilizer or water, and it has a high content of sugars that we can turn into fuels. So Jay Kiesling imagines a future in which plants that don't compete with agricultural crops for land provide the sugars for making fuels, a direct pipeline from grass to your tank. When Karen Nelson joined the lab she now runs, it was 20 years since scientists first invented a way to read the genetic code. But even after 20 years of development, gene reading was still a slow and expensive business. These were projects that were taking two years to get completed and costing millions of dollars to get done. And the sequencing laboratories were these huge rooms with tons and tons of sequences. Gene readers are now smaller, quicker, and much, much cheaper. You can probably get a genome in a couple of hours, and it co probably costs a couple hundred dollars. Karen Nelson is now reading the genes of the microbes that live in and on us, bugs that begin colonizing our bodies when we're born, and soon number in the tens of trillions, far outnumbering our own cells. When you start to read these genomes and realize that for every tiny little cell that we look at, we know less than half of what's going on within that cell. So in some ways, they're actually smarter than we are. And realize that we try to eradicate them, we try to clean them up, we create disinfectants, we do everything. They outsmart us every time. Most of these microbial guests live in the long tube that begins in your mouth, where there are dozens of species, including those that cause cavities. That's one of the better reasons for brushing our teeth. <laughs> Further down in the esophagus live over a hundred different microbes, including one species linked to cancer. In the stomach are hundreds more. One of these stomach bugs sometimes causes ulcers. This area of human microbiology is allowing us to ask these kinds of questions about what triggers bugs to behave differently in different kinds of people. Finally, in your intestines are thousands of bug species, most doing useful things like helping digest your food and making vitamins. Karen Nelson is constantly surprised while exploring this little-known living world inside you. I know I was always a dreamer, and so yes, this world does surprise me a lot. I never ever expected that I would end up where I am and seeing what I see, but it, I think, you know, it's just so much and so fascinating that it's a reward just to be involved in it, and um, it, it just amazes me to, to have this opportunity to see science develop the way it's developed. Got lots of genes to put in. Rob Fraley was one of the pioneers of biotechnology. Having grown up on a small farm in Illinois. My passion was agriculture, and at that point in time, no one knew much about plant genes, and we cracked the code on that and uh, were able to put the first genes in plants. The secret was using a common soil bacterium as a sort of Trojan horse. First, a gene was slipped into the microbe, then, the microbe smuggled the gene into the plant cell. And because a single plant cell can grow into thousands... We're typically producing tens of thousands of new plants every year with new genes and new characteristics, and then using that base system to screen and identify genes that can add, you know, important new attributes to crops. So Fraley's team is experimenting with a gene that allows corn to thrive, 
even when water is scarce. Probably one of my most vivid memories as a, as a kid was sitting around the, the dinner table at night on a hot July or August you know, evening, knowing that there was a drought, knowing that the corn out in the fields was suffering you know, from lack of moisture, watching my dad look out there and say, I just wish that rain cloud had come 10 miles you know, further south, and would, you know, if it would have rained tonight, it would have really you know, saved the crop. That experience is repeated everywhere around the world, whether you're in China, whether you're in the U.S., whether you're in India, whether you're in Argentina, whether you're in Africa. Water is the most important component of really determining the yield of crops. Water's the key. So Fraley's team is experimenting with a gene that allows corn to thrive, even when water is scarce. This is an immature ear from a normal corn plant that's been deprived of water. And this is an ear from a plant with a gene for drought tolerance. Big difference, that, that's really incredible. And as you look to the future, we know the world will get warmer. And so I think this technology will fit a need today and it's gonna probably fit an even more important need for the future.